It takes vision to be able to see clearly, doesn't it? And while this is true when it comes to our eyesight, it's also true when it comes to our lives. And just so you know, our vision here at Epic is super clear. The vision, feel free to chime in, the vision of Epic Church is to see an increasing number of people in San Francisco orient their entire lives around Jesus. That's so good. I have not brain, if you're here for the first time, I have not brainwashed these people. I'm, they're just, they're living into it. Um, and we do believe this. We believe that every single person in this room, because every single person that's ever been created has been made to know and love and follow Jesus with everything that we have and with all that we are. And I want you to know, no matter who you are or where you've been or even what you happen to believe today, Jesus has a vision for your life. I believe that, and we could kind of stop the message right there, except I prepared a lot more than this, right? We could just stop there and go, man, isn't it incredible, Nate? Like, Jesus has a vision for your life. Rachel, Jesus has a vision for your life. Eugene, Jesus has a Like, this is incredible just to know that there are 8 billion of us just on the planet some right now, and Jesus has a vision for each of our lives. It's, it's incredible to me to know that. This means that you and I aren't here randomly with no sense of purpose, there actually is intention behind my existence. And I just feel like we need to repeat that. So I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to have you repeat it. There is intention behind my existence. And again, I hope that delights you, but it also puts a little bit of responsibility on us. If, if I don't have intention behind my existence, I can play this however I want, right? Right? But if there's intention behind my existence, then I need to figure out what that intention is, and I need to try to lean into that intention with all that I have and with all that I am. But I don't simply mean that Jesus has a vision for your big general life. I also mean this. Jesus has a vision for every part of your life. Jesus has a vision for every part of your life. But while Jesus has a vision for every part of your life, did you know that he's not the only one who has a vision for your life? Do you guys know that? Do you know that anybody ever met another person who has a vision for your life? <laughs> Not just one, right? If it was just one, if it was just my mom, right? But there are so many people that have a vision for your life. A boss might have a vision for your life. A mom or dad might. Sometimes I might even have a vision for your life, or you might have one for mine. Uh, a lot of people do. Satan has a vision for your life. Absolutely does. Our culture, in case you aren't aware, has a vision for your life. And you have a vision for your life. And so the question has to be, if there are multiple visions for my life and for your life, what do we do when there are competing visions for our lives? I mean, guys, at the end of the day, you've just got to determine and be decisive about whose vision you're going to lean into, and so do I, and so do we as a church. Whose vision? What's going to be your North Star? Now, how many of you, and again, this is, I'm not going to ask, there's a, we're going to talk about some sensitive topics today. This next one is not one, so I want you to participate. I will not ask you to raise your hand later in the message, and you can smile at me later when I get to the point that you don't want to raise your hand for, okay? <laughs> but now we can. How many of you have um, some kind of corrective lenses, either uh, contacts you wear, keep them up high, you wear contacts, you've worn glasses, or you've even had LASIK. You didn't always see like this. Awesome. Well, I have never worn contacts or glasses in my life. Uh, my general physician was surprised to hear that I've never been to an eye doctor, but I'm sure that's coming for me now that I'm in my mid-40s. Hit my mid-40s next month. Anyway, that's a different subject. But everyone in my family or so many of my friends who wear glasses, I'm amazed when they tell me the difference between what they see without their glasses and then what they see when they put their glasses on. It's pretty drastic, right? And I even have one friend, and I want you to raise your hand if you're in this camp. She says without her contacts or glasses, she basically can't see anything. Anybody? Okay, lots of you. Okay. And, and, and that's wild to me. I also hear people say this once they get glasses on. They will say, I didn't even know what I was missing. And then they will say something like this. Now I know what things are supposed to look like. Guys, because of the vision that God has given us, because there's intention behind your existence, because Jesus has a way of life, no matter what we think about it, we should have a deep desire to know what things are supposed to look like. Now, if you're like me, when I first get called out, I want to war against whoever just called me out. Anybody? Like just that initial, you guys are playing church. I'm going to be honest, right? You're like, oh, like, you know, two minutes later, I'm like, Shauna, you're right. <laughs> you're actually right. I don't want to admit it, but you're right. Listen, what I want to do as we begin this brand new series today out of Mark chapter 10 called Corrective Lenses is I just want you to know that Jesus wants to show us what things are supposed to look like. 
Now, when you and I realize, if we do realize that our vision isn't what it should be, we're not quite seeing things like he wants us to see things, um, we can feel condemnation over that, but that's not what he has for us. I want us to feel invitation. I want us just to feel like we are being, as a church and as an individual, we're being invited just to see things as they are. And we're being invited by a grace-filled God who is full of mercy, a God who offered his life through his son when we were still sinners. So we are in good company with this God today. But over these next four weeks, we're going to see what Jesus' vision is for four really somewhat heavy topics, depending on where you're coming in at. And all of us might be at different places with them. So we're going to talk about marriage, children, wealth, and power. Now, some of you are like, Ben, none of those apply to me. I'm not married, I don't want children, I don't have children, I am not wealthy, and I'm not powerful. Well, hold on, just in case any of these come into your life at some point in time. So today, I want to just straightforward call my message a vision for marriage. A vision for marriage. And whether you're young or old, single, dating, engaged, divorced, don't ever want to date, again, wherever you're at, I just want to give you a word because, you know, you're like, Ben, it kind of feels like we're doing a hard right turn. I know that's kind of what we got when we committed to doing the Gospel of Mark. So we, were just, we just left chapter 9, now we're entering chapter 10. And what you're going to hear in the opening of chapter 10 of Mark is Jesus gets asked a question about divorce. While he teaches about divorce, I don't believe that's primarily what he's aiming for. I want you to see Jesus actually not as primarily teaching about divorce, though that's there. I want you to see Jesus primarily giving us a vision for marriage. So with all of those disclaimers, would you stand with me? And just say amen if you're glad you're not preaching in San Francisco on the topic of marriage. (laughs) Thought so. Chapter 10, verse 1 through 12. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and crossed the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. That's what he's going to do in this series for us. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? That's Jesus asking. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this, and he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. You may be seated. I think that's enough text for today. I'm sure that regardless of who you are and whatever your situation in life is, particularly around this topic, that there's some thoughts and feelings that you have after listening to what Jesus has just said. Um, You may have feelings of guilt and shame. Um, You might be angry. Uh, You might be really hopeful that Jesus has a clear vision for marriage and the intent behind it. Um, You might have decided after just hearing this one topic from Jesus that you don't want anything to do with Jesus on any topic. You might feel all kinds of things today, and I want you to know that you're so welcome here. But I do have one request for you. For the next 25 minutes, would you just seek, would you just try to remain open and even curious on why this is the vision and what it could mean for you. And even if you right now see what he just laid out as bad news, would you hang around long enough just to peek in and see if it could be good news? Would you do that for me? I began in my introduction by starting pretty broad. I said that Jesus has a vision for your life. And then I narrowed it a bit and said, Jesus has a vision for every part of your life. And I want to narrow it even more and say, Jesus has a vision for marriage. Jesus has a vision for marriage. Now, when these religious Jewish leaders come to Jesus, they're trying to test him or to trap him. Uh, Have you ever been asked a question, and regardless of how you answer the question, you're going to lose, right? Like when um, someone says, does this make me look fat? You're like, hmm. (laughs) No, that doesn't, no. um, (laughs) That's the moment Jesus is in. Uh, Just so you know, and I'll tell you about these uh, two different teachings, there were two uh, dominant teachings about divorce among the Jewish religious leaders. 
Um, they both followed a different rabbi. So the two rabbis were Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. And Rabbi Shammai, here was his take. He was pretty strict when it came to divorce. His rule was simply this. Uh, a man could divorce his wife. And this really, hear me, I did not say that. It, that. That is not an inverse option. A man in this century, this moment, among the Jewish leaders, could divorce his wife solely on the grounds of adultery. So that's Rabbi Shammai. Rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, though, he was pretty lenient when it came to divorce. And he said that a man, again, it's just that one way going there, a, a man can divorce his wife for almost any reason. And I, heard this in multi, I read this in multiple commentaries. Both commentators mentioned that Rabbi uh, Hillel said that a man could divorce his wife even if she burned a meal. Two very different views, right? I need you to know that the religious leaders, they weren't really trying to gain understanding about marriage and divorce from Jesus. They knew that if he sided with one, he would be opposed by the other and vice versa. Does that make sense? So that's what's going on. And by the way, as we understand it from the text, Jesus isn't teaching on marriage. It's like they come to test him and trap him. He seems to be teaching on something else. And you may wonder, just a couple of questions I want to answer just to throw it out there. First of all, do I personally believe that divorce is allowed for some reasons? Yes, I do. A second question you may wonder, do I believe that remarriage is good for some people? Yes, I do. Now again, this is such a big picture message because it would literally take us 50 hours for me to speak into every person's situation in this room. So I want to start with vision and then we go and we work out the implications. We're a super uh, unique church here, which is great. Love it. Um, even seeing all of our friends on the Join a Team video, I'm reminded that we literally come to this church from all over the world. And we don't only come from all over the world, we come from all kinds of different faith perspectives and relational perspectives. And uh, I just want you to hang with me for, for today. So... Um, those things are there. My aim for today is, is not to see what we can get away with. It's to see how we can fully live into the vision God has for us. Yeah, that's my aim. Another thing I want to say that's really important, and I'll tell you what's helped me on this issue. I am speaking today like I do every single Sunday, and it's to this group of people. People who attend Epic Church, a majority of who are at least somewhat interested in orienting their life around Jesus. Are we clear? So I am not talking today about the world at large and what it does with the topic of marriage. Clear? So this is not, and C.S. Lewis really helped me understand it. You don't think about mere Christianity, if you've ever read it, as being a book about marriage, but he says something about marriage. Remember, he's doing this in 1952, so 70 years ago, and I want you to hear how he makes a distinction. It's really helpful to me. It may help you in conversations with your friends. Um, because if you're not a person who's interested in following Jesus, we're thrilled that you, you're here. We believe he offers the best vision for life. But what we're talking about today actually doesn't apply to you. We're not holding you to a standard. We're not trying to legalize marriage for the city or the world. Everybody with me? Listen to this from Lewis. Re really insightful to me. Lewis writes, a great many people seem to think that if you are a Christian yourself, you should try to make divorce difficult for everyone. I do not think that. My own view is that the churches should frankly recognize that the majority of the British people, or for us, San Franciscans, everybody knows that the majority of San Franciscans aren't Christian. Is that news to anybody? <laughs> Just wanted to make sure we weren't, like, I wasn't missing them all somewhere. <laughs> I didn't know how big of a church we needed to pray for when we go prayer walking in a moment. He writes, there ought to be two distinct kinds of marriage, one governed by the state with rules enforced on all citizens, the other governed by the church with rules enforced by her on her own members. The distinction ought to be quite sharp so that a man knows which couples are married in the Christian sense and which are not. Really helpful for me as I have tried to pastor people on issues of marriage, dating, engagement, sexuality, divorce, remarriage. I'm not trying to legislate anything, first of all. I'm certainly not trying to tell people who don't want to follow Jesus what they should do as non-followers of Jesus. Like, that just doesn't, that doesn't play. It doesn't make any sense. And so that's what we're after today. Now, I want you to notice the question Jesus asked them. It's really insightful, and I tried to kind of point out the verbs and the way I um, stressed some of those verbs. They, Jesus asked them, what did Moses command you? Hold on to that verb, command. What did Moses command you? And listen to how they reply. Moses permitted. Hold on. Do you, do you catch that? It's subtle. I've taught this before. It's, it's subtle. What did Moses command? They're like, well, he permitted. See, Jesus is asking, what is the ideal? And they are asking, what can we get away with? Yeah. And here's what I want to say about this topic, but every topic. I want to give this to you. If you're interested in living out our vision here, 
And I believe the vision God has for your life. May we lean into God's vision for our lives rather than seeing how far we can lean away from it and still be okay. Let me say this to all of you, because most things don't happen overnight with everything we're talking about. Would you agree? So in this box, there's a square on this stage, and if you can't see it, I'll try to demonstrate it by um, where I stand. So what I'm urging us to is to lean into God's vision. So my, my feet, don't get nervous. I'm, I'm, I'm right. I want to lean into his vision. But sometimes in particular areas, some of you, it's not marriage for you. It's going to be the wealth thing. Others of you, it's going to be, you know, the power and service thing. Um, if we try to see what we can, how we can lean away and still be okay, our feet will start at the back of this line. But let me promise you, you won't stay at the back of the line. Right? That you will either move the line or try to move the line or you will just cross the line. And again, this is every topic. So what I'm urging us to, let's lean into what God has for us rather than lean away from it. Go, am I okay now? Am I okay? Because what Jesus said to them is, Moses allowed divorce because your hearts were hard. Let me make a promise to you, even if it doesn't feel good right now. You do not want God making concessions for you because you have a hard heart. I'm grateful that he will. That's grace. But it's not the vision. I do not, Ben, because your heart was hard, I allowed you to do this thing as a dad, as a pastor, as a husband, as a follower of Jesus. And, and if your heart is hard, like Ben, what does that even mean? It means your heart is closed off. It means you've decided you're not going to let God in, and eventually God might just walk away if you look at Romans 1. He sometimes gives us up to our desires. And so my encouragement would be to ask for a soft heart. Ask for a heart of flesh. Ask for a heart that's pliable, that's, that's moldable. Now, what is Jesus going to do with the vision for marriage? He's got three options if you look at what he's done in other instances, and I want you to see which one he chooses. The first option I see that Jesus could have at this moment is to do what many of you will be familiar with. Anybody remember when Jesus would say things like, you've heard it said, fill in the blank, but I say to you something different now? Right? So he could say, you've heard it said that marriage is this, but I'm going to give you something different. He, He doesn't do that. The second option he could do is say, hey, there there were some things that were placeholders until I came on the scene, but now something better is here, and that's no longer a part of what we're doing. Anybody remember where Jesus, and we talk and we sing about this, where Jesus said, you don't take new wine and put it into old wineskins? So he could have done that here. He could have said, hey, um, the original thing from marriage and the Mosaic law, it was from Moses uh, about marriage and the Mosaic law, uh, it it was uh, old wineskin, but now I've got new wine and here's the new teaching. Guys, he doesn't do that. The third option and the one that Jesus takes is he holds up and affirms the original design. And some of you are like, Ben, give me a fourth option. No, he, he holds it up. He points back to, he's like, that's not the intention. Here's the intention, and here's how strong it is. And this is where, um, and you're like, I had to tell, you know, I feel like on these topic days, like after the last service, I had to tell every first-time guest I met, like, hey, I don't preach on marriage every week, just so you know. Like, it, something like calling maybe next week, or, no, I was actually will teaching about children next week. But after that, we're talking about wealth. I mean, hey, come back in April. We're going to do this resurrection thing. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be so powerful. But when it comes to marriage, when it comes to things like this, we, we don't want hard hearts. And, and I realize, like, we're swimming upstream today, but what Jesus does in affirming the original vision God gave for marriage is he quotes Genesis 1 and 2. And I want to tell some of us that's a problem because a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about Genesis 1 and 2. Now, Jesus doesn't parse it all out for us. He doesn't talk to us about old earth or new earth. I know some of you like to geek out on that. That is not my thing. Go for it. But we see from Jesus quoting Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that he believes it's true. Why else would he? So we need to ask ourselves, why would we? So, so he goes back and he quotes Genesis 127 and 224. And I want to give you those and then add verse 25 of chapter 2. In Genesis 127, Jesus just quotes this verbatim. He says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Genesis 2, 24, and then I'll add 25. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So here's the vision. As hard as it might be to swallow, as hard as it might be for me and all of us to live out, here it is. The vision for marriage is this. United. One flesh, 
no shame. What God has joined together, friends, is meant to be kept together. And understand this, the vision of marriage is to live united and not divided. Do you guys know that when you see division, that's never the work of God? And again, let's draw it up beyond marriage. In marriage, division's not the work of God. Between races, division's not the work of God. In the church, division is not the work of God. It's not. God intends for us to live united. Now understand this. Our culture views marriage through a lens of convenience, but Jesus views marriage through a lens of covenant. <clears throat> you know, if I, if I could be honest with you guys, I don't want everybody in this room to be wearing masks, um, but when you were wearing masks, I couldn't tell what you thought about what I was saying. <laughs> Today I'm like, oh man. And I don't use notes. I don't know where I should focus. Our culture views marriage through a lens of convenience. But Jesus views marriage through a lens of covenant. A covenant is a promise. It's a pact. There's a reason why we call it they are taking wedding. Yeah. Tim Keller writes this in The Meaning of Marriage. He says that in a covenant, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. In a covenant... The good of the relationship, us together united, takes precedence over my needs or your immediate needs. Now, we've got to know that our culture's current vision of marriage is miles away from the vision Jesus has for marriage. Because our culture's current vision of life is miles away from the vision Jesus has for life. Because our culture is insistent on all of us living lives that are wrapped in and around ourselves. Am I wrong? Go watch 90% of your politicians, bosses, executives, maybe even pastors. I don't know. And I realize what we're saying. The world we live in, you're like, Ben, hold on. You just gave us that Lewis quote, and you said you weren't going to help us live out our culture's vision for marriage. I'm not. Well, Ben, why are you telling us about it? Here's why I'm telling you. Please lean in. The reason I'm mentioning our culture's vision for marriage being miles away from the vision Jesus has for our marriages is this. So many of us, that call ourselves followers of Christ are being more formed on this topic by our culture than by Christ. And you can call yourself whatever you want, and this is subtle. You're not in trouble because of it, but you'll be in trouble if you don't realize, oh my gosh, I am being formed by all the things that actually aren't Christ. Guys, it is so common in our church, and the big C church, For people to, like when I meet people, I'm just watching and I don't have it down for sure, but I'm like, well, this person is talking the Jesus game, but the decision he makes, the decision she's make, the thing that they do in their marriage, the way that they do with their body, the way that they don't spend their money on anyone but themselves, you are not being formed by Jesus. And you're like, Ben, you can, no condemnation. I just want you to be formed by Jesus because whoever you become, that is all you offer this world. And every person in this room is being formed. Like, no, Ben, I don't even pray. Well, you for sure then are being formed. I'm being formed. I'm becoming someone. And at the end of the day, I can only bring to my marriage who I've become. I can only bring to my parenting who I've become. And guys, I will only step into eternity as the man I've become. And it is a pull. You're like, but Ben, you're the pastor. I, I get the pull. This is an upstream message to preach, and it is even more upstream to live out in the midst of the world that we live in. And some of us, if we're honest, we might just go, man, I wish Jesus would have done the thing where he said, you've heard it said, but now I'm saying, do how you want. But he doesn't. And I love you too much. Too much. And I can just tell you this, the people that I've spent the most time with on the back end of living relationally however they want, they tend to be the people with the most regret. They tend to be the people whose mindsets and emotional and mental well-being are most in need. And I'm telling you, there are single men and women in our church and there are married couples in our church that need to say to so many of you, hey, come and follow us as we follow Jesus. If you have a healthy singlehood or marriage, you need, to, you need to offer that to this community. Don't we need healthy singles in our church? 
Don't we need healthy couples in our church? And don't we need unhealthy individuals and couples to know that there's health here, and if you get in an environment of health, you can become healthy. I'm fighting for that. Let's get around the table. Let's laugh, and then let's ask the hard questions. And let me say, I haven't always been a good husband. I haven't always had pure thoughts. I'll just say that to you. I'm grateful for what God's done. I'm grateful for the couples that invest in our marriage back in the day and that still do. I need it. And I'm grateful for the the fact that God is a redeeming God and he loves and he cares. So um, with the time we have left, you've got to be asking the question, at least I assume you're asking the question, what is all of this big picture vision of marriage and dating and sex and relationships and divorce and remarriage, what does it mean for you personally? I'm going to give you two questions that you can take with you to this topic and every other topic. And it's this. When when we think about this topic, again, all the things, um, here are the two questions. Really important. They're simple questions, massive implications when I teach it to you. The two questions are this. When it comes to dating, marriage, sex, your thoughts and practices, your past and your future dreams, what is behind you and what is in front of you? What is behind you and what is in front of you? We all have things behind us that we're not proud of. Anybody besides a pastor? Are you guys still playing church? And I'm assuming 100% of us on this particular topic have things in our past that we're less than proud of. Let me show you what happens from Satan's vantage point with the things behind you that you're less than proud of. What he does is he keeps bringing them back up. You ever woke up and you haven't thought about it in three years, something you did, and then it hits you? That's not from God. What Satan loves to do with what's behind us that we're less than proud of, he loves to keep bringing it up and accusing and shaming and condemning. It is what he's good at. He is, Jesus said, the father of lies. So the worst thing you've done on anything with this topic, the worst thing you've thought, whatever, he just keeps bringing it up. But when it comes to what's in front of you, Satan keeps trying to deceive you. He keeps saying to you what he said to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Did God really say? Did God really say? And moment by moment, in a subtle way, for the most part, he leads us off course. And we're so deceived that we think we're living out God's truth when we're far, far away from it. But notice what God does with the two questions. When it comes to the less than proud of stuff behind us, God says, I'm going to offer my life for you while you're sinning. If you confess your sin, I'm going to be faithful and just to wipe your slate clean and let you move forward. And then when it comes to what's in front of us, God is always going, hey, today, if you confess and repent, if you turn from that and turn to me, we'll just declare amnesty right now, and we'll have it from this day forward. You can fully live into the vision I have for you. I don't care how many marriages you've had. I don't care what you've done with your body. From this day forward, anybody glad that your past, as we sang earlier, it is wiped clean. You don't have to wear grave clothes no matter what you've done. You don't. You can keep putting them on, but Jesus is going like, I died to take those off. I want to speak to a few groups of people, and I can't be exhaustive because we've got a prayer walk that we need to do. If you are single, I want you to know some things. You are so loved, cherished, and valued here. You're not less than. You're not waiting until you have a spouse so you can really contribute to the kingdom of God. In fact, if anything, 1 Corinthians 7 seems to teach that singles actually can make a greater contribution to the kingdom than we can who are married. Jesus was single. Paul was single. You do not need to be married to have a fulfilling life. You do not need to have sex to lead a fulfilling life. You do need intimate relationships to lead a fulfilling life. And church, whether we're married or single, could we make a renewed commitment to provide a community with a thick web of relationships where we can be family to each other and we don't have to go find it out there? This is so huge. We're with you. Second group, if you are divorced, I can only imagine even at hearing that word, what that feels like, what you think, the shame or the regret or the, you know what, I wasn't that committed to begin with and you have a flippant attitude towards marriage. Now, I don't know where you're at on that. I just want you to know, just like singles aren't less than, you are not a has-been. You're not. I think about John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. Jesus shows up. This woman, she's coming to draw water at noon because of her shame. And she has shame because everyone in the community knows, oh, she's been married five times. She's now cohabitating with a man who isn't her husband. Jesus shows up and doesn't get into all that. He just says, I want to give you living water. You have been looking to men to do for you what they will never be able to do for you. But I'll give you this and you will never thirst again. 
Did she walk away condemned? Did did he heap more shame on her? No, she walked away and went to the very people who she was ashamed to let see her and said to them, come meet a man. Could he be the Messiah? No condemnation today. Invitation, grace, mercy. Three, for those of you that are having sex outside of marriage or before marriage. Jesus had a chance to change the meaning. He didn't. When he says one flesh, he means you don't need to give your flesh to someone in the practice of sexuality until you commit your entire life to them in the covenant of marriage. I thought I'd get a ton of amens. That's exactly, every time I rehearse, I was like, God, this is where they're going to go. Preach louder. And I'm not saying any of this is easy to live out. I'm just saying there's grace for it. And if he's worthy of our trust for all eternity, then he's probably worthy of our trust on this topic. And let's fight together. It's a fight. Let's have people we can text, hey, I'm feeling tempted right now. Hey, I did this last night. Have somebody say, hey, that wasn't good, but there's grace. For you, for all of us who've been in that, which I won't even ask to raise our hands, because I think every hand would be up. Think about John 8. We've got a woman caught in the act of adultery. Not that she committed adultery two weeks ago and found out and then brought before everybody. She's caught in the act of adultery, brought before all of these men, these religious, holy, please see the quotes if you're not looking up, these holy men. And Jesus happens to be there. Thankfully, he was truly holy, but also full of grace. And with what was behind her, Jesus said this, I don't condemn you. Oh, but can you imagine? You're caught in the act of adultery, brought before the most holy man to ever walk planet Earth, and he doesn't condemn you. Guys, if Jesus doesn't condemn you, quit letting the world condemn you. Quit letting the church used to go to condemn you. Quit letting your ex condemn you. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been set free. We've got to tell each other the truth. Some of us are drowning right now in condemnation. But then what's in front of that woman? Go and leave your life of sin. I don't condemn you, but there's something better. There's something better. And then the fourth group I want to talk to are those of you who are married. And if you're in one of the first three groups, you think, oh, the married people, they're the ones fully living into God's vision. You might be legally married on paper, and have a marriage that is a million miles away from Jesus' vision for your marriage. You're going through the motions, but you're not bringing your best. You tend to choose selfishness over servanthood. You tend to make decisions about business trips and money without consulting your spouse. You tend to let her or him be the dominant one that's raising your children. There's good news for you, too. Your marriage could be stagnant, stifled, or horrible right now. And I still need you to know what all of these other categories need to know. Jesus loves to redeem. You'll hear me preach on April 17th, that resurrection message, that there is resurrection power inside every person who belongs to Jesus. And if there's resurrection power in you, again, it's only up to you, your part, and then a spouse has their part. But don't you believe, church, can we believe four people with stagnant or even terrible marriages that God can build a really beautiful marriage? Anybody believe that for people in our church? You need to know that. We believe that. And if you're ever say, hey, staff, could you introduce me to couples who their marriage was down and out and God brought something beautiful? Absolutely. All day long. All day long. Well, why is marriage such a big deal? Marriage isn't ultimate. Marriage isn't ultimate. Marriage is a gift, but it's not ultimate. So why is it a big deal? Here's why marriage is a big deal to Jesus. It's because faithfulness is a big deal to Jesus. Aren't you glad that faithfulness is a big deal to Jesus? I mean, you guys, Jesus is trying to make us what he is, right? If we're going to orient our whole lives around Jesus, we need to orient our faithfulness around Jesus. Listen, when you blow it, does he walk out? When you forget him, does he forget you? When you choose to stop loving him, does he ever stop loving you? Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If you are faithless, and we've all been faithless in some of our relationships, even when you've been faithless and I have been faithless, he remains faithful. I think that's enough for today. 
I realize that as many people are in this room, there are at least that many kinds of responses and at least that many kinds of situations. And um, there might be a number of prayers you might want to pray based on what we've talked about today. It could be that Jesus, just generally speaking, help me to align my vision with yours. Um, it, it could be um, help me to believe there's no condemnation for me. It, it could be for the first time there's something that is behind you that you just need to confess and come clean. You're like, but Ben, doesn't God know? I know, but listen, I've learned this truth. When we, over, when we uncover something, God covers it. But marriage isn't ultimate. Ben, do you mean if I'm single and I never get married that I'll always come up empty? Yes. And I mean if you're married and you make marriage ultimate, you too will always come up empty because the greatest man or the greatest woman in the world will never be able to hold the weight that Jesus alone can hold. And he's here. And I want to pray for you. As we begin to uh, just move towards a time of response, this altar will be open. You can come and pray. None of us are admitting anything at this altar other than, God, we want you. We want to see clearly. You know we need your help. God, thank you for your grace over this room over the last hour. God, thank you that um, we can be a church that gracefully talks about hard things. God, thank you that as singles and marrieds, we can build a community that's a really a thick web of relationships where uh, we don't have to go search for it elsewhere. God, thank you that there's grace. Jesus, I pray that you would soften our hearts. I pray that you would help us to even pause the argument we want to have with you right now. And Lord, you know what implications there are if we try to orient our lives around you. You know we're swimming upstream in this culture. And God, I pray for anyone who's been divorced that they would feel so valued, so worthy. God, I pray for every single person in our church that they would feel so honored here in this community, so seen by you and by all of us. God, I pray for anyone, any couple indeed that's having a one flesh relationship without totally committing themselves to one another in the covenant of marriage, God, I pray like I was able to see uh, just couples over the years be able to push their wedding dates up and, and celebrate and live in your goodness and your plan and vision. And then, God, for the marriages that are on the rocks, pray for grace. God, I pray for really a true uh, kindness from you that leads to repentance. God, I pray that uh, despair would turn into hopefulness. And God, I pray that we would become a church more and more and more where if you get in the flow of life at Epic, whether you're single, married, dating, engaged, divorced, or never are interested in dating again, that you can have a healthy life because there's a healthy environment for everyone here. God, would you help us to live that commitment out? And Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're faithful. Thank you that when we walk out, you never do. Thank you that you remain, even when we don't keep our word. Come and make us new. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. And uh, I thought Seth picked out a great song that we were going to close with, just this idea that Jesus is ultimate. And no matter how good the rest of your life is or how terrible it is, um, that living water he promised the Samaritan woman, it's available to every one of us here. So let's respond. And again, this altar is open if you want to just pray and, and, and commit yourself or, or, or just speak to God and ask for his help.